Um, welcome to the Maker Urbanism panel. Uh, my name is Rebecca Ross. I'm a lecturer in interaction design at Central St. Martin's and also a postdoc fellow there in spatial practices. Um, before we begin, I would like to say thank you to all of the Maker Fair organizers put, for, for putting together an incredible weekend. And thanks in particular to Irini for facilitating today's Maker Meetup at the v and um, So our panel has both the privilege and impossible responsibility of having the last, w the last word of the fair. And perhaps as a kind of a bookend with Ava's Politics of Making panel this morning, during this panel and as wrap up of the first ever London Maker Fair, um, I'd like us to, to push us to continue ex exploring the broader implications of making. So Corey's not here anymore, but um, in his book, Maker, Makers, he famously described makers as, quote, people who hack hardware, business models, and living arrangements to discover ways of staying alive and happy, even when the economy is falling down the toilet. This combination of resistance, resourcefulness, skill, and creativity can be liberating for the individual and perhaps his or his or her, her, his or her immediate communities. Um, but, but my question, however, is whether and how maker culture does and could scale up and contribute to changes on a larger scale, in particular, the scale of cities. How can we make sure that what we're doing within the making culture and in the making community is more than techno fetishism and adds up to something greater. So the panel that I've put together for today considers existing and potential relationships between maker culture and grassroots urban activism and advocacy. Um, we're going to try and explore what maker, what implications making has for urbanism in the spatial aggregate. Each of the panelists brings with each of the panelists engages with the city, in particular with London. They're all working in London. Um, from a different rich perspective, and each brings a different take on themes such as community, infrastructure, place, and politics. And I'm just gonna, I'm, I'm only gonna say a few words about them biographically so that I can actually leave them to introduce themselves with their work, because I think that's what really will set up the discussion. Um, so first we're gonna hear from Dominic, Dominic Wilcox, and Dominic is an artist, designer, inventor, and thinker-upper who works within the territory of the everyday, and he's especially interested in everyday objects, buildings, human interaction, um, and, and normality. Um, that's gonna be, um, Dominic's going to be followed by Angus Main. Angus has over um, 10 years of experience in creating digital and electronic projects. He's a graduate of Bournemouth and London College of Communication, and he currently runs the physical computing workshop at Central St. Martins, and is a visiting lecturer and tutor at the Royal College of Art. Um, he's interested in particular in ways of joining up virtual information and data with physical environments and objects. Um, this, Angus is going to be followed by Christian Nold. Christian is an artist, designer, and educator interested in new participatory models for communal representation and mapping. Um, his book, um, Mobile Vulgus, examined the history of the political crowd, um, and that was published in 2001. Um, Christian graduated from the Royal College of Art in 2004, and he's currently um, a researcher in the citizen science research group at University College London. Um, finally, Priya Prakash. Priya is a technologist and social innovator. She has worked for the BBC in Nokia and has an MA in interaction design from the Royal College. And of particular relevance to this, week's, this weekend's Maker Fair, Priya also lives and works in, Elephant, in the vicinity of Elephant and Castle and often works in collaboration with Suffolk Council. And I'm gonna let each of them introduce their projects. Um, so let's start with Dominic, please. Okay. I think you're all set there. Hello. Um, what am I going to say? Uh, about ten years, about twelve years ago, I had a job. It was in a bookshop. It was in Foyle's bookshop, and that's the last time I had a job. And ever since, I've been sort of. Um, you know, what I'm interested in is uh, imagination, creativity, innovation. That's it. That's all I'm interested in. I, I love that, that thrill you get with that eureka moment. And so I'm sort of spending most of my time um, trying to find ideas, you know, this search. I mean, uh, I really like Leonard Cohen, and he was asked, where do, you get where do you get your ideas from? And he said, if I knew that, I'd go there more often, you know. And um, so I was interested when I was asked to be part of this maker fair, um, you know, and the discussion, I was thinking, no, maker, it's not really my, I don't see myself as a maker, I do make things, but that's not the central thing, it's about ideas, and 
I like to make sort of observations on people or uh, behaviour or whatever. And I do that through objects. And I, I've got a blog, it's called Variations on Normal, where I'll do sketches and inventions, um, you know, um, which make comments, I suppose, about people. Um, and then if I think it's worth making something, it really has to you know, have a good reason for being made. I'll make it, you know, if it gains something. But I'm quite reticent about making. However, one of the methods I do use is um, experimentation through materials and, um, you know, just getting your hands dirty as opposed to uh, sketching in a book, which is also what I do as well. Um, so I was interested. I went to the Maker Faire yesterday. And um, there's a lot of 3D printers there, um, Raspberry Pi, uh, Arduino, and I, I'm not a techie person. I'll, I'll normally come up with an idea or an observation and then think, how do I, how do I make that uh, a reality in some way? So then maybe I, I might um, you know, think about technology and using it to, to do something. Um, but anyway, you know, the difference between making and creativity, you know, you know, it's, the thing about being a maker is you can be a maker without actually being creative at all. Uh, you can have a lifetime of making things and not have a creative thought. Um, you know, I went to the, to the Maker Faire, there's lots of 3D printing, there was, there's, there's people, you know, you can, you can go on a website, you can download an existing object, an elephant, a toy, and you can print it on your 3D printer. Um, and I said to the, the lady behind the desk, why would you want to do that? She, she was quiet for a little bit and she says, no one's asked me that question before. <laughs> And I suppose it's, you know, it's actually, I know why, I was joking, I was sort of being a bit cheeky, but um, it's because, um, you know, maybe it actually taps into the essence of making. So you can actually uh, download, choose, select your object, download it, and create an object without actually even touching the object. It maybe, and it, it gives you that, that emotional thrill of making without actually making, and maybe that's why people enjoy that. So to go from that to then being creative, um, you know, it's that process of getting to the creator that I'm interested in. Anyway, this, um, this is one thing on Twitter. I'm on Twitter and I tweeted, um, first I tweeted, uh, the, the thing about rapid prototype machines is actually how slow they are. They're not rapid. It's a, it's a lie. Um, and then I tweeted, uh, I want to race against a 3D printer to make the same thing. Me against the computer. Man, I'm representing mankind against the machine uh, to make the same thing. And actually, and there was a curator saw this, Beatrice Galilee, and she said, I'm, I'm in Milan in La Rinascente, which is a big uh, department store, and we're doing some hacking and making event. Do you want to come over there and compete against the 3D printer? So this is what happened. We, we, I made a, a model of the Domo, which is a cathedral um, in Milan, uh, out of a block of clay. And I'm not a you know, I'm not a crafty person. I've not made anything out of clay since plasticine when I was a little boy. And um, so, yes, there was that. And we found a 3D printing company and they got dressed up as Mario sort of brothers. And it was all, you know, we had a crowd and I came out in a white dressing gown with rocky music. And you, you can see that and there's a countdown. And then I did it here at the V&A. Um, so anyway, that's on the internet. But now how do you progress? Uh, yeah, the, um, so I've just picked out a few, a few little projects I have done. Um, this is my um, nephew uh, in New Zealand. I was there recently, and we were skimming stones, you know. And um, I was interested in the idea of value. What is valuable? So we buy objects, and um, it's a very materialistic uh, way of uh, getting uh, something that's valuable. But is it really valuable? Because there's things like time. Time is valuable and um, patience and anticipation. That anticipation moments we have up to something, that's got a great value, if we could get more of that. So anyway, this, so taking that subject, and um, I basically, I've, I made some, um, some luxury skimming stones. So I got such, I, I went around lakes um, and coasts and, and I found some skimming stones that I really liked. I thought that these ones I would really love to skim, but I'm not going to. And I, uh, I gold leaf, leafed them, 24 karat gold leaf, and then I, I've made uh, pocket, uh, little um, belt um, pouches, which are specifically designed to hold um, the, the skimming stone. 
And then, you know, just thinking about what this is like to have this skimming stone. So, you know, I wrote a story. This led me to write a little story, a short story about a guy who has his golden skimming stone and he carries it around for 23 years, three months, three, three weeks, two days. And then he's faced with the perfect conditions. You know, it's a day like this, it's, there's no wind. That He's in front of a lake that is just like a mirror. And he takes the stone out of his pocket. And, he, and you know, his heart's beating because he knows this, this is it. This is, his, this is the ultimate chance to skim this stone perfectly. And what if it plops in? And blah, 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 blah. And anyway, so, um, so yeah. So that's, that, that, that's something that I like making objects maybe tell a story or about something else. They're not about the object itself. And just one thing I wanted to just say about the making process, uh, what I saw yesterday, and you know, I definitely you know, agree with the idea of, of experimenting and making uh, things and learning the Raspberry Pi and, and uh, creating from finding surprises from that process. But I, I think it, one of the dangers it can be is that it's a very heads down approach. So you're in the box and you, you, you're tinkering and, you, and, you know, and it's a sort of organic way of moving, of, of creativity, if you, if, you, if you want to be creative. Um, you know, it's one little step at a time. And I think it's important maybe to lift the head up. You know, if you think about Tim's, um, you know, even Tim, Tim's alien uh, anal probe, you know, he's, he's got, you know, he knows the, he knows how everything works and, and, you know, I'm sure a lot of his ideas and thoughts come from that, but ultimately at the beginning, you know, he, he had his head up and he's thinking about the world and he's thinking about aliens and UFOs and, and then he's thinking, well, how do I make that work? As opposed to just starting from the little Raspberry Pi and working one LED out to two LEDs to three to, you know. Anyway, I could go on, but next one. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm, I was commissioned to make a souvenir of uh, East London, and East London is not, it's, um, you know, there's not many big monuments, it's not like this, you know, wonderful place. I'm sure there is, but uh, not, not quite. And um, so to make a souvenir of East London, um, you know, I thought, well, there's a lot of makers in East London, people who make stuff. And um, so what I did was I created this vinyl record, which was uh, cut in Hackney, which is where I live. And I visited 21 different makers. So as makers of food or objects, or there was a songwriter, which I counted as a maker, an illustrator. And, and I simply took a sound recorder and I recorded the sound of them making, whatever sound they make, tick, 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 tick. Um, so he's, so this, this is the vinyl uh, cutting um, lathe. Um, this has actually got some sound. I don't know whether you've got any sound on this. Um, I, did you hear it? Oh yeah, this is the reel-to-reel -reel tape in the, in the recording page. Which was a good sound. It's a nice sound to have on the record. Is it, I think. So that's the first track. Um, this is Claire Mallison, The Sound of Drawing, Rosemary Chicken and Sweet Potato. This is her in the drawer looking for the pen. Uh, she draws food for the times. And I just left the sound recorder on the desk. And, left. and um, yeah. And this is a, 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 a this is actually, you know, one of the, I went to Terry de Havilland, who's a famous shoemaker, he's on Kingston Road, and then I recorded him, and then he said, oh, why don't you go to Steve? Because this guy who makes, um, it's, um, they're called press knives, and basically used to stamp out shapes from leather for shoemaking shoe -making or bag making. And he's in uh, Leighton in this, like, industrial estate with no name on the front, and then you go in and there's all these knives, and he just, like, bends the, these long uh, strips of, of, of metal and um, into whatever shape you need. So it was, a, it was a nice, and I was taking my sound recorder, so I did interviews and photographs and did a website it's called soundsofmaking.com. Uh, this is um, this is Alga Works, which um, they used to make the, the, the glasses for the NHS. 
in the millions. And then that got, uh, I think it was privatised, or anyway, anyone could do it. And so they, act they actually made, you know, glasses for John Lennon and um, Eric Clapton. And, and now they go, but they're, they're bespoke, so they only make small amounts. But they've still got all of the machines from the NHS years, except I went upstairs and there was only one guy going from each of the machines around. And, I, and he said, oh, don't photograph that machine. You know, it was one of these green ones. He says, because the Chinese, they would pay a quarter of a million pound for that machine. And it was just a little, you know, because it just did it in a special way. Anyway, there's lots of these stories. Uh, this is Whitechapel Bell Foundry. Uh, this was tuning of a bell. Uh, how do you tune a massive church bell? Well, you scrape off metal from the inside. So that's him clamping it in. And, uh, yeah, because they've got, they've got bells from um, a church and all of the bells had been made in different times and so they'd never actually been tuned together. And so the people in the village had been listening, uh, listening to out-of-tune bells for a hundred years and their job was to tune them together. And that's the back. Um, and then final project, so I just wrote out all of the um, sounds. Final project was, um, it was a commission from Northamptonshire Council and it was to design some to create some shoes. And I thought, I'm not, uh, you know, I want to do some interesting shoes. And I thought about the Wizard of Oz and Dorothy and how she had her ruby red slippers and when she clicked her heels together, she got taken back to Kansas. And so I thought, is it possible to use uh, modern technology uh, to do that? So I created these uh, shoes with the G inbuilt GPS which you plug into your computer. On the left shoe, it points in a direction. On the right shoe, it's a progress bar. Um, so you go on your computer, there's a map, you, pl you plug it in via USB cable, you plot on the map where you want to go, press upload to shoe. The shoe knows where you want to go. There's a switch on the inside of the shoe. You click your heels together, which starts up the GPS, which is pointing to the, that's it, that the antenna's in that back uh, little piece there. Uh, this was the process of making. I worked with a shoemaker and uh, electronics person. And then I just engraved a drawing on the back of a little man walking through. And that's that. Okay. <clears throat> That's me, Angus Main. Hello everyone, um, I'm Angus Main. Uh, I work at the University of Arts and Royal College of Arts. Um, my website is there, Break and Remake, which I think is kind of sums up the theme of today, a lot of what we've been talking about. Um, I'm kind of a, a lazy maker, because I actually I don't do a great deal of making myself, because I don't tend to have that much time. Um, I tend to help other people do their making. So at CSM, at the Royal College of Art, kind of help students put things together, make projects. But I'm gonna try and show some of the projects that I've done myself today. And I'm also gonna talk a little bit just about kind of my philosophy, I guess, the aim I'm trying to get at with uh, doing these projects. So as a sort of overarching aim, uh, this is mine, to break digital information away from the screen and into our physical environment. So into the objects and the spaces that we actually inhabit. Um, this has kind of been what's driving everything that I've worked on since, since university, I guess, even maybe beyond that. Uh, because I'm really dissatisfied with screens. I don't know if other people feel the same way, but uh, I have a real problem with this, this diagram here. Um, this is the official way that you all have to use computers. If you have a, have a job where you officially have to use a computer, um, you have to conform to this. This is the DSE. Uh, uh, that's display screen equipment diagram of how to officially use a piece of computing equipment. Um, and as you can see, it doesn't really make a lot of sense and it's not very flexible and it's not very nice and I don't think many of us would recognize that as computing. Um, computers are great, we all know that. We know the, the power that computers have, what they can do for us, how we use them, um, but it doesn't look like this. And if we want to be able to get the best out of computers and we want to be able to bring it into our environments and the objects and the things that we use every day and make it a bit more human, um, then we can't be doing this. We can't be using screens in this way. Uh, so everything that I'm trying to do, I guess, is, is trying to break away from this, trying to take the stuff from the laser beam eyes of the man looking at the monitor um, and try and just 
build that information and the power that the computer can give us, try and build that into the things that surround us, things that we already have with us, um, or into the environments around us. And obviously, um, environments for a lot of us will be the urban environment, will be cities. Um, so how can we build the information about the cities into the cities themselves? Uh, so this is more like what computing looks like, um, looks like increasingly. This is what we see computing as. Uh, so we know things about LilyPad and Arduino and embedded computers, and they're, they're built into the things that, that we own and that we possess. Um, we've also got augmented reality possibly coming along. We've got the idea of screens being kind of embedded almost within our vision. Um, so you're not actually have to consult a sort of black, um, dark, glossy screen to get that information out. Um, and that's, I think, quite exciting, and that's why I'm, I'm, I'm trying to kind of do my work. So I'm, I'm more interested not in human-computer interaction, which we're familiar with, and, and still a lot of the stuff that we've been looking at today, I guess, would be branded human-computer interaction. I'm more interested in what a lot of people are calling human data interaction. The, the computer goes without saying, I think. We, we know that we use computers. We, we don't have this scenario anymore where we have to tell people to visit a computer and use it in a certain way. Um, people take computers with them everywhere. They've, they've got computers embedded. You know, they've got it in their pocket. Uh, they've got it in the objects around them. So really what's more interesting is looking at what we do with the data uh, and using data as a, as a tool, as a material that we can, we can play around with and we can build into our lives and our environments to tell us useful stuff for us, not prescribed, but the stuff that we find interesting about our lives or is useful to us. So I'm much more interested about how we deal with data. It's not about humans versus computers, which I think the human-computer interaction kind of set up. It's much more about... Uh, humans and computers versus the world. You know, we've got computers, we can use them. How can we use them to get data more interested? So, uh, these are a couple of projects I've worked on. Um, this one was done in collaboration uh, with John Fass, one of my colleagues at the RCA. Uh, this is part of quite a broad range of uh, uh, kind of investigations we're doing into news, and how we look at newspapers and, and news in the new digital age. And it's changing a lot. And a lot of the ideas we have about news and how we consume news uh, have been changed by the internet, changed by digital technology. Um, so the, for a start, the, the very idea of having um, kind of iterative news, a definite physical iterative news cycle where you have a newspaper one day and then the next day you get another newspaper and the next day you get another one after that and you can look back through them and you can compare and if, you know, if the story changes over time, it's there, visible in front of you, you can't kind of hide it. Uh, that's changed now completely and we have People get most of their news information now from websites, and, and a website can be changed, and it can be altered, and it can be reconfigured, and it can do that silently in the background, and you'll never know about it. Um, and that, I think, is to the detriment of truth and, and, and getting to the, the genuine uh, story behind the story. And it's that story behind the story that we're interested in. So um, we have some uh, digital uh, solutions looking at how to improve websites so you can see when changes have been made. Uh, but this is a solution looking at physical newsprint. Uh, so this one uses an LCD screen that's kind of been messed around with, um, and it overlays information onto the physical page. Obviously, this is a prototype. It's not the, not the final thing yet, but it's part of the experiments we're doing to see how can we bring data, the, the useful information, the, the, the story behind the news story, the stuff that actually we're interested in finding out that tells us the interesting story. How can we get that to users? Um, in a way that's kind of intuitive, that you know, that they can see it side by side with the with the actual object that they're looking at. In this case, the newspaper. Um, so yeah, that's one thing we're looking at. Uh, this is another one I've been working on recently. This one is kind of scratching an itch that I've had for a long time, which is to know a bit more about uh, the skies above me. So uh, as I sit in my in my studio at home, looking out the window, which obviously I do quite a lot, probably a bit too much, um, I can see this steady stream of aircraft going over me. Um, and I think when we're looking at the urban environment, I think that's something that kind of goes without saying. We don't really think about this fact that we have these aircraft streaming over, plowing over our airspace all the time. Um, and I'm intrigued. I, I just kind of find myself intrigued about what are these planes, where are they going, how many people are on board. You know, there are human stories, and there's, there's a story attached to all these objects that um, are kind of miracles of flight going over you. Um, so I wanted to know more. So this is... Um, just a kind of a, a, a quick project looking at how can I find out, for, to a, for a start, where these planes are going and where they've come from, what distance have they travelled. So this is just a simple device that uses 
um, information from the internet, so it's, that data is there, the, you know, the internet is this great resource. I can go to a website and maybe find that information. If I sat there looking at these planes and every time I went over, I could go to a web page, find out that flight number, find out what it is. But I wanted that more in my environment. I wanted it so I could just look out the window and there's something there a bit more ambient telling me where the information about these planes. Um, so this is a device that does that and the globe moves around and it points to uh, the, either the point of origin of the plane or where it's going to. And it also points to where the plane is. So you can kind of tune it and you can find out particular planes. Um, and it's quite easy, you know, in, in a way to put this stuff together because the data is there. Obviously there's physical skills that goes with this, um, which I'm not that great at. Um, but the data is there and, and I'm, I'm interested at how we can extract that data out. It's been put there at great cost and you know, great effort by lots of people um, and build it into something that, uh, that we can look at and we can understand straight away. Um, the final one I'm going to show is just this Houston Road stethoscope, which is quite a hard one to, to show, really, because it's, it's really context sensitive. This was responding to a brief which was um, on my master's program a couple of years back, um, which was information environments. And the brief was to curate something about the Houston Road, so curate the Houston Road in some way. Um, and I guess a bit like my intrigue about these, these airplanes and honestly going overhead, um, I became really fascinated about what was below the road. We all know, I guess, in, in, in London that there's a whole world beneath our feet. Um, there's all kinds of things going on, um, e either kind of archaeological or you know, active. There's, there's a whole life being led on, under the ground. Um, and Euston Road was a great example of that. There was a lot of stuff happening. Um, this is kind of an early uh, sketch which uh, kind of shows when they were constructing the, uh, the Metropolitan Line. Uh, there's tube lines under there, there's sewers, there's uh, a pneumatic dispatch cove tube, whatever that is. Um, and what I was trying to get out to people was, was what is under this, because it's all still there, there's all stuff happening under your feet. And as you're walking down the road as a pedestrian, how can you get to that information? There's kind of a bit of psychogeography tied up in that as well, and, and that idea of being able to work out the psychology of the place and get a bit better of a feeling for the, for the space that's around you. Um, so I created a kind of digital stethoscope. Um, it wasn't kind of a, a physical thing. I did think about it for a while creating something, that, a physical object, but I wanted people to use this. I didn't want it to be a specific device that you had to go and buy. So it was, uh, in the end, a, a website, a, a website that was designed specifically for use with phones, so an iPhone, for example. And it allows you, it gets the geotag of where you are, so it gets the geographic data about where you are as you walk along this road, um, and you put your headphones in. The idea is it's not visual at all, so you put it in your pocket, it's just a black screen, really. Um, but as you walk along the road, you can hear what's happening below. Um, and that, what is happening below, the information from that is pulled from research, in some cases, just working out where these locations are, but also live data. So, for example, there's about six or seven underground lines that that go on the Euston Road at various places. Um, and that's, on the website, is tapped into live data because TfL put all their information online. So as you're walking along the road, uh, if there's a train passing underneath you, we can, we can know that. We can know that from the data. So the website updates and plays the sound of trains going underneath you rather than just kind of an empty echoey tunnel. Um, but there's all kinds of other stuff that you just wouldn't know was there. The River Fleet, for example, runs under Euston Road. Um, and you can locate it with this device. You can walk along, and as you get nearer to it, you can hear the trickling of water. And there's actually a whole kind of water system underneath the road that's hidden away. Um, and you can work out when you're standing on top of it because it's, it's nice and loud. Um, and you can find out more information about that on my website if you want to check it out. Okay, I think that's it for me. Okay, um, I'm not going to talk about my own work. Oops, sorry. I'm not going to talk about my own work. I'm going to try and talk to you about citizen science. Um, I'm at UCL in something called the Extreme Citizen Science Group. Um, and I guess my question is, do makers want to adopt or kind of join in with citizen science? And what might it mean to join within, in with it? So citizen science is this kind of funny area that we're kind of looking at in our group where, this is one of the definitions, for example, 
projects in which volunteers partner with scientists to answer real-world questions. So it's very much about volunteers and scientists. Um, this is a definition from Cornell. And just to show you a kind of some of the classic projects. So for example, lots of these are kind of bird migration patterns where you try and get people, you know, like the, the nice family over there kind of collecting data and then sending it to scientists. Um, so for example, this is from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology who also did that definition earlier. So embrace the winter, count feeder birds for science. And some of the other kind of classic examples is the kind of galaxy zoo thing where they try and get you know, volunteers, normal people in their idea to kind of use these kind of online systems or things that also exist in the world to kind of help them classify. It's very much about data gathering, collecting, um, and you know, basically the fundamental idea is that scientists have not enough time, so they're kind of trying to crowdsource your time to try and help them classify galaxies, for example. Now, there's a lot of discussion within that about, you know, the ethics of it, the kind of type and the kind of amount of involvement in that vision of citizen science, right? I mean, it's very much about, you have a very clear idea of a scientist and you have a very clear idea of a volunteer in that kind of vision. That's not really what I'm gonna talk about. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about things that are kind of crossing over with the maker community. So this is the air quality egg that you might have heard about, which is about kind of trying to measure the air quality around you. Um, and this is, kind of, this, this is a project that was kick-started, and um, they had a lot of people who decided to kind of contribute money towards getting this thing made. And it's kind of trying to answer pseudo-scientific questions in the sense of like, how polluted is my neighborhood? These are things that we normally leave to scientists or kind of authorities to answer, but suddenly you have individuals or perhaps a collective trying to answer this. And interestingly, they're kind of engaged with scientists, but kind of not. Um, so you could argue this is citizen science happening. Um, I mean, that's maybe one of my questions. Another one is the kind of balloon mapping um, projects that are happening where people are kind of sending up kind of cameras up balloons to try and map areas and in a way that you wouldn't normally be able to do, right? I mean, Google Earth, for example, is always out of date. If you have a particular agenda like a demonstration where you'd like to have a top um, God's eye view of it, kind of being able to send up a camera, getting images to, that you can stitch together would be something very powerful. So again, these kind of projects are being kick-started. Um, and I think they're very exciting. And I guess I'm gonna call them what I call device-focused practices. It's very much about the thing, you know? It's very much about the gizmo. And I think really focusing on the gizmo in this way has some really strengths and some weaknesses. So the main strength of it for me is that it actually it has a kind of new collective empiricism where you're actually going out and re-exploring the world together. You don't take the kind of science as a kind of given, you're actually re-exploring it for yourself. And I think that's potentially very, very powerful, the com especially the combination of the two, doing it in a kind of collective way. But I would say the main weakness of this kind of approach is that it often seems to adopt this kind of scientism, this kind of naive idea of realism which kind of tramples over kind of social and local complexity. And I want to try and show you what I mean by that. This is the kind of general view of um, a lot of these kind of devices, you know? There's a kind of, there's a, there's a device in the middle which is the exciting thing, the mobile phone thing running some kind of app. Then you have the world on the right hand side over here. And somehow the idea is the world is somehow going into the device which is producing data, right? And somehow that becomes science and becomes useful. So this is the kind of general metaphor. And actually, you know, you have the faceless person over here, and there's no kind of context for this. So I think this is what I mean by this kind of slightly naive idea of realism. So just to give you a sense of this, this is actually one of the research projects I'm working on at the UCL. So I'm watching, looking at what happens around one of these apps, which is designed to gather um, data around noise. And, um, you know, you can make a recording, basically, and then it can make a map so it can locate where you took a recording. Now, the thing is, this is actually what citizen science looks like, right? These are citizen scientists. These are people who care about noise because what we're doing is that this map is actually around Heathrow Airport over here. So these are the people who actually care about noise and these are not the typical kind of iPhone users you'd imagine, right? If you think of the iPhone advert or like the, the kind of iPod advert with the nice white buds in your ear, kind of dancing around in some cool way, these are not these people. What they are, they have issues. They have issues that they're trying to explore. 
So the reason they're getting involved in this project is because they want to push um, political agendas about trying to draw attention to the amount of noise around the third runway, what that, the impact that would have for local people. And they're trying to communicate the, the kind of real experience of having a plane going over your head every 90 seconds. None of which the scientists or the kind of classical science, this kind of science way of dealing with noise are interested in. And I, th I would argue if we adopt this kind of scientism view, we're also not going to be able to engage with the kind of real issues that people have. So for me, the kind of challenge that I'd like to present to you is a kind of developing a critical material practice for kind of maker citizen science that actually deals with issues and that deals with collectives and deals with the kind of doing the stuff in a reflexive way. So it's not just kind of like naive way, we need to try and get as much data as possible and that somehow that by doing this massive gated data gathering, we somehow get to the answer and so on. But actually, we, we kind of make this in a slightly more strategic way as part of a general um, issue campaign with collectives. So, you know, developing a critical practice, um, I think, is a really the way forward if we want to engage with citizen science. I'll leave it there. Thanks. So hi, everybody. I know it's a um, long day and I'm the last person here, so I'm going to make it quick. A uh, bit about myself and why I started Changeify. So I'm a designer by training and also an avid cyclist. And I used to work at Nokia before I started this off, and I was trying to fix the portals outside my street in Camberwell Road. I used Fix My Street. I wrote to my counselor. And you know, you get this moment of ep epiphany where I realize, gosh, to make change is really hard as an ordinary person. I'm not an activist and nor am I a hacker as such. I have designed lots of products and services, but at the same time I thought, how can an ordinary person actually just, you know, start doing something in their own backyard which can contribute and affect the larger city? So Changeify has been a personal journey for me, and it's been uh, really interesting to see how far we've come from here. So I'm just gonna walk you through a very quick story just to kind of unpack, and a lot of this is based on uh, personal anecdotes, and hopefully through a storytelling I can show you what we're actually doing. So if you think about John as a keen cyclist and he's kind of fed up of having his bike stolen, there's not enough bike stands or also the dog poo problem on the street. And he comes across Changeify in his uh, local shop. And basically the, it's an app, it's just like downloads. It, uh, you don't need to download, it's a web app. It just directly starts working, takes a photo, his, his phone goes into camera mode. And then he adds a comment about how can he actually solve this. What's interesting and I'm interested is about crowd solving, not necessarily complaining. And we really, really want to see how can we tap on the collective intelligence. If you see what's happening in Istanbul, what's happening in Brazil, what we realize is civic engagement is really not happening. And you're used to complaining and writing notes to your council. So how can you get other people who solve these problems locally also suggest what you can do in your own backyard? So he gets back a suggestion. And he goes forward in his, um, on down his house. And he takes a photo of the bike problem, problem that he has outside his house. And again, we are appealing to people who are the Instagram addicts. So as a designer, I like looking at the design of habits and behaviors and piggybacking on existing habits and behaviors. So people like taking photos and sharing stuff on Instagram. So how can you bring the same kind of you know, citizen reporting to the normal issues you see on your day-to-day -day life? And when you take a photo and you share it on Changeify, it goes around the neighborhood where his uh, neighbor, Tejal, sees it and likes it. And this kind of spreads like wildfire across the neighborhood where more people start liking it and sharing it on social media. Now, I know Christian mentioned about not everybody's on a smartphone and, and not everybody's access to these you know, huge Android devices and stuff. But what we're looking at is how can you in your own neighborhood actually start getting support for some issues? Because you think about it, it's very hard to see who else has the same issue like you. So it, um, as you go on and you actually share this on the other side of the town, what happens is the local businesses who are also signed up on Changeify start seeing the kind of issues that um, that John has been talking about, and here you can see that John's bike parking issues actually got quite a few likes. And Evergirl, who's a um, coffee shop owner actually in Camberwell, his shop exists. And what we're also looking at is like lots of big brands have not paid their corporate tax, 
and they're really losing this trust on a grassroots neighborhood level. So how can we tap on their collective conscience to actually back up these projects that are coming from people in the neighborhoods where their shops are? So we know that Starbucks currently is in trouble. So we're thinking about how can we hook on to the current advertising models like the Facebook ad campaign. If you can see a particular issue has got a lot of likes on Facebook and John has got his issue quite high up, instead of spending useless money on social media campaigns, these brands could put that same money on the kind of community problems that people are trying to solve in their local neighborhood. And at the same time, what the platform tries to do is join the dots where, say, Councillor David, who's also logged into the system, can see a project that he's been tracking is actually backed. And he gets a real-time index of all those issues that people are kind of reporting in his neighborhood. Time flies, more people in the neighborhood come and help John out by giving their resources or workshop to kind of help make these bicycle stands to solve the problem. And when John has, along with other people's help, actually solved the problem and managed to put these bikes outside various shops, he actually earns these good points which can be used in the local participating shops. And the reason why we're using, and I'm putting brands like Starbucks here, is I really want to talk about the economic system. The fact is all these large brands exist and the fact is a lot of businesses are funded by advertising and we want to hack the existing kind of models, the business models to actually use that money to back local issues. So what we've been doing, I'm not going to spend time on our model over here, but just want to show you very quickly that we run these events like neighborhood walks where this was in Camberwell in the food festival. We get local people to, we actually have a stall in the farmer's market. We get local people to come and put, map what kind of issues they face in the neighborhood. We then take the local residents on a walk where they actually kind of take photos of things they want to change. We actually speak to the local businesses, which are the backers on the projects that people are reporting on. And um, this is what happened yesterday at the Maker Fair when we did Change of Our Elephant. We had the neighborhood regeneration map. We have over here uh, Kate Johnson, who is the senior planner from Southwark Council. We also had uh, the guys from Mamushka and uh, Artworks participating. So we're actually trying to join the dots between different people in the ecosystem. And we went on the walk, there was local historian Stephen Humphrey talking about the history of Elephant Castle. And we actually had the senior planner there talking about the regeneration plans of Elephant Castle. So we're really trying to see how we can get all these different people talking by actually co-creating these maps. And we created our citizen toolkit here, which basically you don't need to be an architect or a planner. You can just pretty much take your little toolkit and start creating your own stories of how you think Elephant Castle can improve. So there's a couple of stories out here from people about saying, you know, the, the artworks, containers is highly contentious. So how, can, how, how do people actually use that space or this idea about the roundabout? How can you know, kind of make it better for cyclists? We had a very interesting idea of the shopping center becoming a making center given that replicator warehouse is there. How can more people actually start making stuff and selling that at the shopping center? So what we're really trying to do is create this neighborhood loyalty where people can support their local businesses. They come up with ideas on how to change their neighborhood and the local businesses back them up by giving them the seed funding. And at the same time, the people can go back to the shops and spend those points there. It's a very short video which Thank talks about a project from Changeify Camberwell. Everything, basically. Let's promote it. Let's take it to the people. We need a stall on the farmer's market which is available to local businesses um, to use on a rotational basis, no more than about twice a year each, so they can promote their, their uh, cuisine. Each week we'll have a different uh, country and the restaurants from the local area that uh, offer food from that origin will come together and offer free samples on that week. Uh, so hopefully then people will be drawn into their restaurants. <laughs> so as a crowdfunding platform, what we notice is instead of just creating projects where people are asking for money, we get people to actually solve the problems in their community. So that was a case where a lot of local shops um, in Camberwell, they attract certain kind of people from communities like the African Nigerian uh, restaurant, but they wanted to get more footfall. So we had students come from Camberwell College of Arts coming up with new ideas on how to make that uh, restaurant much more accessible by designing a better menu, unpacking some of the local ingredients. And this is now gonna go into like funding where the council is supporting it by having a stall at the Camberwell uh, farmer's market. So these are small hacks on a bigger city system and we hope that by creating this platform we can enable better citizen engagement. Thanks guys. Is this, is this working? Can you hear me? 
So thanks, everybody. Um, I think the progression is, does everybody have a microphone somewhere? Um, it's quite interesting because um, as I was listening to the presentations, I sort of charted a little bit of a progression from, I really liked what Dominic said about having a reason to make something, and I think that that's a really good starting point. Um, and then um, Angus's project, particularly related to the Houston Road and also the newspaper project, um, re uh, reflects an interest in, in a kind of transparency, looking around at the city and understanding, well, how is this made? And reflecting on the fact that the city is something made but at the same time, the conventional, and, and this is a very sort of uh, almost a naive way of putting it, but the very conventional makers of the city, the planner, the designer, um, clearly aren't serving everybody's needs and under, kind of understanding what's underneath everything um, allows us to reflect on that. Um, to Christian's presentation, which um, the the citizen science work, I think, is especially interesting because um, one really has to, it's, it's really responsive to a breakdown of, of systems. And I think it's, I think it's, I think it's really curious that, um, I think it's really curious that it, um, I mean, in the particular context of, say, noise pollution, it's a case in which um, people are getting involved with these projects and monitoring noise because they have, um, they have something that they want to change that they don't have other avenues to make happen. Um, and then Priya, who's worked on a platform for change at a neighborhood scale that connects people who want things changed to people who could change them to people who could resource making them change. So that's sort of the little kind of the relationship that I tracked between the four presentations. But I guess um, uh, I guess I wanted to start by asking the panel if they had questions for one another, if we can. <laughs> Otherwise, I have some ready. But actually, I was thinking, um, I was thinking in particular, um, well, actually, th is there anybody who has a question for one of the other panelists as a start? I've got kind of a general one. Please. Um, I've kind of been interested today about seeing all these people working on these projects um, and kind of been wondering where they work on them. Um, and especially relating mm -hmm. to our topic, which is the urban you know, landscape, right. urban environment, where's the best place to be kind of working on these? We have things like hack space, which is a good, good space to be working, but not everyone has access to a hack space. Um, and from looking at the projects which have just been presented, you know, we've seen things happening at farmer's markets, we've seen things happening in uh, community centers. Um, so where's the best place for these kind of activities, for these making activities to take place? I don't know if anyone has any feelings about that. That's quite interesting also, and, and there's, I mean, you visited a lot of places in relation to uh, the sounds of making in East London. Do you want to take a stab at that? Mm, it's, for me personally, I, I tend to, you know, I'm a bit of a loner. <laughs> but your brief was, to, the, you, that was a commission. That was, yeah. And yeah, and, and what I really en enjoyed about that, because it made a change, was that I was working with other people. I was meeting other creative minds. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one, as I said, I, I visited a shoemaker who said, oh, why don't you go and see Steve, who does something equally interesting. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wouldn't have met Steve, who then said, why don't you go and see, you know. Um, so this uh, be becoming more inter interconnected between these creative people that are dotted around London, so London so full of makers and creative people. And uh, a lot of people work in a little bubble um, naturally, because that's the way to get things done quick, you know, do it yourself. Um, but, but that's what I find interesting about these, um, all three really, is that it, it, um, it's an attempt um, to make us more connected, not only in, as individuals, but, you know, as interconnected with the city and, um, you know, feeling all part of it. And maybe that's, the few, that's what the internet is so great about, um, bringing individuals together. And um, so I suppose I would like to um, be in more involved in more of that sort of interconnective um, creative stuff. It's just find you know it's just finding the right website or, or hearing hearing the stories, you know. Right. And yeah. 
I can give my practical example. So I tried to find a co-working space. I actually went to Hub Westminster because I thought that's where all the social innovation type people hang out. And what I ended up realizing is I saw a lot of people talking about policy and change, but I didn't meet the real people whose problems I was trying to solve. And I felt quite fake, to be completely honest. And I didn't want to be sitting in a co-working space surrounded by people with a lot of, you know, there's a lot of good stuff being discussed there, but the actual action is on the streets. So I realized I actually actually had to get into a residential association. So we went and uh, approached um, a Peabody Estate as well, where they have residents actually having their own kind of spaces where you could be part of that. And that was successful for some time, but it felt like you know it was too small for us to just be in one particular neighborhood. And in the end, the farmer's market, even though it's quite old school low tech, it's where people actually make a point every weekend to come to a local farmer's market. They meet other people, there's a natural gravitation. And that has been our most successful place to, to kind of interact with, I would say, normal people. Yeah. I, mean, I, I think that's something that you can see from a lot of the projects that we've seen all throughout the day is that they can be quite individualistic. You know, you're, you're, I mean, certainly the ones that I've done, I've worked on problems that I see myself, that, that I want in my life. I want this thing that tells me this. Um, and unless you're working to a brief that kind of takes you out, then you, you can end up working in a bubble, as you say. Um, so I think that's, you know, what's great to see from your project is that when you get together with other people, then really what you're doing is finding other problems to solve. You're not just solving your own problem. Um, and I think we just need better spaces to be able to do that in a way. We've got here, we've, it's just, yeah, we've got individuals, I mean, on this panel, I think, and, and throughout the Maker Fair, there are m many individual makers who are sort of working by themselves or in small groups, but then we've got loads of institutions who are involved, you, and you know, here we've got a platform, we've got people with university affiliations who are doing things by themselves in their own time. We've got an artist who's involved in the art world but also works by himself in relation to the, you know, kind of developing ha his modes of interacting with that world. And, and then there's the world of science and all of its networks. And, and, and so how, how one moves from one scale to another is really complicated and interesting to try and understand. Um, from that, that kind of individual act, the individual meaningful act, to, um, to something larger. And I think the farmer's market's really interesting there because that is where those kind of many different scales can collide. Yeah. Um, does anyone else on the panel have a question for anyone else on the panel? Anyone? Sorry. I was just wondering, Pri, uh, is there anything that didn't work, that you thought, that you tried, that failed, that you thought, oh, people are like that, that, that people will work with this, but they didn't bother? A great question. I think um, we got our first neighborhood completely wrong. We first uh, started in Shoreditch, and it was way too trendy. Um, we also realized that in Shoreditch, people, it was a very transient space, so people came there to hang out in the evening and have a good time, but they necessarily didn't care much about the same way like people who are residential in a neighborhood have been there living for a long while. And this is a mass generalization, so I'm not hoping to like piss off people who live in shortage, but then we had to get to a neighborhood where people have been living there for several years and there were active, uh, like say, residential groups, probably not like uh, active on social media, but within themselves they had created some kind of networks and they wanted to do something. And we realized in uh, smaller, much uh, less trendier neighborhoods, there was this strong community ties and once we put ourselves in those kind of places, we could also monitor whether something that people proposed could actually get you know, rolled out. We don't think we have been so fully yet there in actually getting the outcome from the project, because a lot of social change projects like you know, take a long while. But what we've slowly started doing is an ordinary person knows what they can do if they want to make a change. They can go to a farmer's market. They can have a conversation. They can take a photo. So that at least is slowly starting. Maybe I can answer something. Work, things it working. Is it is working? Okay. I mean, I think we need to be a bit careful about talking about change a little bit. I mean, I think all the really difficult issues just don't change. I mean, in my experience, participatory projects on the whole tend to fail as a default, and you just have degrees of failure, and that's because fundamentally the way things are set up, it's, it's very hard to change them, and especially kind of lots of things. I mean, if you think of an airport, what can you really do about Heathrow Airport? It's the most you know, the whole of the British government is so heavily invested in multiple levels in this institution that there's very little that you can do about it, but there are some te technical interventions you can make. So, for example, the people I'm working with, the kind of changes they can make is that the flights are about the morning flights, that there's actually a legal limit to the amount of flights that they can make at four, that's four or five o'clock in the morning. 
and they're actually you know, going over them. So we're building devices that identify these particular flights at five in the morning because that's something they can really push on, right? So I, I think, I guess I'm, I'm just kind of want to be aware of when we talk about changes that there's, there's, a, there's some, certainly some things that we can do as kind of smaller groups of people, as collectives, you know, we can set up food groups, we can do all these kind of things, things that are within a kind of easy remit, but some of the kind of larger things that I think technology is certainly involved in facilitating and can address, I think are very hard to have change within. So I think being realistic and actually thinking about what structures we need to have in order to engage with these kind of larger institutional issues and what kind of technologies we might need and what kind of spaces we might need to meet in in order to kind of do this, I think is a, is a difficult question. It sounds like you're talking a lot about, I mean, how, to what extent is citizen science basically checking, it's, it's checking established expertise, established specialism, and holding it to its word, or? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I mean, I think in many ways, it's a lot of the classic citizen science is a way of, for scientists to get free labor, right? right? Um, but I think there's, we can, if you just tweak it a little bit, um, and just kind of start thinking of this being a new way of dealing with the kind of issues that you know, we've left to the kind of institutional establishment for a long time to mediate, like the whole of nature, right? If we start actually running nature from scratch, um, then I think we have a different idea of what citizens' minds might be, right? Right, yeah. Um, okay, um, is there anyone from the audience who wants to ask a question? Hello, that's uh, me again. Um, we used to be a nation of um, men with sheds, forgive me ladies, um, at the end of the garden and that's where you'd often see an uncle making, modifying a cabinet, repairing shoes, etc, etc. Well, now we're a nation where our sheds have got beds in them because they're being converted to uh, residential accommodation. The Pathfinder program has turned thousands of homes into multiple occupancy flats and multiple dwellings where people don't have the space to be able to do making. The Arduino is great, you can do it on your kitchen table, but there's the real making, playing around with things, modifying, is happening is not happening in urban cities because there is not the space to do it. We've been anti-cars for years now. Now people are wondering where they're putting their bloody bicycles because they're not, they're not going to have them in their bedrooms. And I, I agree with anyone who's a cyclist saying, do you know what, I'm not having that in my bedroom. Where are you going to put your cycles? The idea of maker and urbanism, the urbanism is the important part here. Our cities are not designed to be able to have the kind of people making things in it. And hack space is a lovely idea, but um, one hack space in a city of six million people, come on, nowhere near it. Yeah, so I mean, I, I think that's a really good point. And it's, uh, it's, it's a problem with <coughs> urbanism generally. I don't know if that problem exists outside the city. I mean, it'd be interesting to know whether all sheds are disappearing around the country or whether it's a, it's a particular problem to London. Um, but I think we just need more hack space. I mean, I think, I think that gives us a model. I don't think that's where it begins and ends, though. And actually, there's, there's a lot of um, industrial units around London uh, which aren't being turned into residential yet because they're not in areas where people want to live yet. Yep, but it's true. And people are, are desperate for places to live. And, you know. Um, but I could also sh I could take you around Tottenham and show you quite a lot of places in Tottenham where there's a lot of industrial units which uh, which they're desperate for people to be doing industrial creative things in. So maybe it's a question of using those spaces a little smarter. I, uh, I, um, oh, sorry. There's just one other thing about the hack spaces. I've always felt that I would. I'm lucky. I live in the country and I have a big shed. But um, hack spaces. I need a lot of stuff. Yeah. I have a large stores, and hack spaces don't really pr allow you to keep a lot of stuff. And stuff to me is vital. I mean, it's sort of, I get ideas from the stuff that I've got. And, you know, re recycling, if reusing is better. You know, you keep 
stuff from old projects, and I have stuff from 30 years ago, and it's still useful, you know. So it's not, hack spaces aren't the only answer to making things up. I think, I'm gonna maybe say something slightly unpopular here, but um, on the other hand, I think that there's a way in which um, having a large amount of space allocated to one individual or a small group of people um, can, you know, sh it, there, there's a way in which um, community spaces encourage community interaction that individual spaces don't. And I'm not saying that individuals don't ever kind of come out of those those sheds or garages or wherever they've been working to interact with other people. But there's a, I think that there, I think that there is a balance yeah. to be sought. And actually, um, I think that when people are able to remain isolated from other people that they can go into their own world to a certain extent and and I'm, I, I, I agree though I agree that there's um, there are questions about where certain kinds of things can happen in a city like London and there are loads of institutions I mean UCL just set up the Institute for making for example there are loads of institutions trying to get involved but I think it's I think everybody is still experimenting with what to offer and how that offer is going to be meaningful. Can I just add, because yesterday in our work, we went and visited Pulin's yard, where we have the makers and their studios, and there was a really good interview there with, uh, we had with uh, Stephen Barber, who's the lute maker, and he has a really amazing wood making shop. And one of the things he was talking about is students coming out from LCC and other places, you know, where would they go as a maker to find a studio? And funnily enough, on the opposite side, you have a startup like uh, the Artworks. Now, obviously, it's dubious. You can say that they have containers. They are short term. But we have st other startups like VR Pop-Up, creating shop spaces where you can trial your business idea on, in your shops which are lying vacant. So I think it's about tapping on some of these existing movements where I feel currently also uh, London studio prices are quite expensive. So you can have transient spaces. And of course, you won't be able to have a studio with all your equipment there forever. But getting a studio space, even for a three months or five months lease for somebody coming out of college and trialing out a business idea, prototyping it, and checking it out, whether people in the neighborhood like that, is something quite attractive. And it's, in a way, that's a way in which that's a form of making the city and remaking the city. And in, in some way, I mean, uh, restrictions are the mother of invention, in a, in a way. And um, I mean... I, I tend to think of what I do is sort of um, making the most of what I've got, but I take it to a sort of professional level of, of that, you know, and um, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm used to having a tiny little space, and I actually, I did get a big studio once, it was very, well, it was about 400 square foot, and I was in the, uh, I was in the corner, and I, and I was looking at the space thinking, I should do something to fill this space, I thought I would make bigger stuff, um, but actually, I had no ideas, and I, and I didn't fill that space, and I just felt, oh my God, I'm spending all this money on this huge space every day. And so I went back into my little space, which is where I'm happy working, and I'm happy making the most out of this situation, and, and it, it, it makes the imagination work harder. I think if you've got nothing to push against, if everything's easy, uh, you tend not to think, have any ideas. But. Yeah, I mean, I, I really would agree. I mean, one of I, I really like your example of you know the kind of makers being the kind of printing the the elephant on the, uh, on, the on a 3D printer. I, what I really am missing a little bit is diversity within the kind of hack space movement. Actually, you know, I'm I'm used to kind of come from a, a place where you had kind of back space run by James Stevens, and you know he now has deck space where you really had a diversity of of kind of practices happening. And I kind of think we need a, a kind of broader range of spaces with kind of broader ideas happening because I, I feel a little bit that almost a, the hyper mediation of the maker culture creates strange homogeneity actually of of what is being made and so yeah i definitely think having more more tension that's kind of explicit um i think towards something you know moving with something working having collectively working towards something rather than just having this kind of un undiscussed kind of conflict that always seems to hang around in a hack space I think is, is really the way forward. I mean, I, I think the other aspect of that is that it doesn't all have to be in London. I mean, I, I agree that you get this kind of universal themes that come out of places like Hackspace and people working on the same kind of projects. Um, but that's because there's a small amount of people working in, in, in one big city working on the same kind of things. And actually, it's interesting to look at what's happening out there in the regions. Um, and we've seen some of it today, so some of it from Norwich, for example. 
Um, and I'd be kind of interested to see more of that, what, what else is happening out there. Can we take another question? Yeah. Um, hi. Yeah, as, as someone who has worked with community groups and I've volunteered in many different projects uh, and I've set up no, non-profit making um, spaces, um, it is great to have that collective and community way of working, but sometimes the, the collective and community structure sort of tries to kill the individual spirit. Um, you know, you get this kind of Stalinist sort of um, strata that kind of says like, oh no, that's not allowed. You know, this is, we've got to have a meeting about that or, you know, it's not in our constitution to allow this kind of thing. And I see again and again that it is really difficult as an individual, particularly for creative people or artists to operate um, within that. I mean, I'm not saying hack space, but you know, the other ones, art gear, and there are many different spaces I've worked with, all kind of them, and each one have that issue uh, in different ways that individuals find it difficult to work within that structure. How do you think we can deal with it? I'm sorry. And I, um, I, I guess it, it can be hard if you've got you know lots of people working together they, it, within an institution, then that institution can um, dictate to a certain extent. But then I would probably look as an example at art schools. I work across two art schools, and I would say they're quite large collections of individuals all working on individual stuff. And I think on the whole, um, the institution isn't dictating what those people are doing. They're all trying to be as individual as possible. Um, so I think it can work. Are we, are we, how are yeah. we for time? Well, yeah, we're supposed to finish quarter to okay. five and it's already, so maybe, uh, yeah, we can wrap up. <laughs> um, okay, so I think I guess we're going to wrap up the day um, and uh, I'd like to again say thank you to Irini and um, thanks to everybody for the makeup. Thank you. Thank you to all the speakers. Thank you very much for coming. Here.